Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Six years ago this week, Haiti was hit by a devastating earthquake. Billions of dollars in aid were pledged, but little made it to the people in need. Why did that happen? Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Anthony Lowenstein talks about disaster capitalism and the great Caribbean feminist Jackie Alexander gives us a rare interview. All that and a few words from me on laissez-faire capitalism that isn't. Welcome to our program. Social solidarity smashed by mysterious forces in debt-laden Greece. A medical clinic targeted in Afghanistan. Could all of this reflect the chaos and cruelty of which disaster capitalists get rich? Our next guest lays out that argument pretty clearly in a searing new globally reported book. He's Anthony Lowenstein, an independent journalist and author. His latest book, Disaster Capitalism, Making a Killing Out of Catastrophe, is just out from Verso Books. Anthony, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Your book draws a lot, and you acknowledge it, on Naomi Klein's work, um, The Shock Doctrine, uh, with which that phrase, disaster capitalism, is often associated. How would Mm -hmm. you say you uh, differ from her or go beyond the work she did? I was inspired by that book, came out in 2007, and I really wanted to continue it and deepen it, and I guess in a few different ways. I felt that one issue that book didn't touch on, a lot of criticism, but just didn't focus on so much, was immigration particularly. I think in the years since um, her book came out, immigration and the privatisation of that in the US, in the UK, in Greece, in my country, Australia and elsewhere, has become a central way that private corporations are making money and maintaining and deepening the refugee crisis. So that was an important point. And I think also for me it was important to say that her ideology and the one that I share is, I think, the ideology of our age still. I mean, her book didn't come out that long ago. Right. And I think... For me also, the disaster capitalism was a way to explain so many events, not in a kind of conspiratorial sense. I'm not arguing in the book that what's happening in Afghanistan is exactly the same as what's happening in Greece, for example. But I do think that there are deep connections and often the same companies, Mm. which I think I focused on more in those companies Mm -hmm. more than she did particularly. Lay out a little bit um, this Mad Max economy that you're talking about. When did you first realize, oh, all these pieces are kind of fitting together? I think... That partly came about through various different reporting. I particularly, I think I used that reference in, in relation to Papua New Guinea, a country mm-hmm. that doesn't really get much press in here in the US. Papua New Guinea is a country near Australia. It's to the north of my country. It's one of the richest countries in the world and yet also one of the poorest. Some of the largest mining companies in the world, Rio Tinto and others, are based there. I focus on an area called Bougainville, which is a small province that had the largest copper mine in the world until the 1980s. People were getting virtually nothing. Rio Tinto was getting everything, a very typical relationship. And when you visit there now, there was a civil war that existed for about 10 years. It killed about 20,000 people. Locals essentially rose up against the mine. And the locals won, which is pretty rare because normally in these situations, the mining company who aligned themselves with the Papua New Guinean government and the Australian government and the US government Mm -hmm. and the British government, I use the Mad Max analogy, not that because Mad Max is obviously an Australian film, but because the landscape now is almost like this industrial wasteland. Wait, so the people won? They won, but now the issue has become that there's talk about reopening the mine. Bougainville wants to be independent. Bougainville wants to split from Papua New Guinea. And the way that can be done, according to the local government, is the only way is if you reopen this mine. There's Mm. been no environmental cleanup. There's been none of that. And I wanted to use that as an example for global readers to say, A, it is possible to resist these forces that seem overwhelming. It's Mm -hmm. possible to resist massive mining interests. But the cost of that is huge. And I'm not saying it's not worth the cost. It's not for me to say. But I do think it's important that we look at the reality of what Mm. that means on the ground. Now, in some places, it's not so obvious what the predatory capitalists are after or what they're getting. I mean, you write about Haiti. A lot of Mm. people watching might say, what's there to get in Haiti? Well, a lot. I mean, I talk about the context post-earthquake. There was an earthquake in 2010. There is 200,000 people killed. It's a devastating event. And WikiLeaks cables show really interesting that soon after the earthquake happened, the then US ambassador is talking about a gold rush in Haiti. And what he meant at the time was a gold rush for US businesses Mm -hmm. and corporations. So in Haiti itself, yes, there are resources. Yes, there are natural resources which haven't mostly been mined. And the U.S. solution, so to speak, to that, pushed by the Clinton Foundation, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, and now increasingly Chelsea Clinton, the daughter, is industrial parks, basically making cheap clothes for you and I to buy at Walmart or um, 
gap or wherever. So that's the so-called solution, which mm -hmm. has not worked. But more importantly, the way in which USAID, the US aid arm, operates there through contractors mm -hmm. has been to hugely benefit US contractors here. So when Haiti was given by the US government and other organizations up to $10 billion in relief. Mm -hmm. Most of that money does not go to Haiti. It, it never goes... leaves the United States, right? Absolutely. And that's, I think, one of the great myths about the aid and development industry, that an event happens, Haiti, Papua New Guinea, Afghanistan, most of it doesn't go to the country, it doesn't even go to the people in mm -hmm. those countries. So a lot of Haitians, I've been there twice in the last years, saying, well, all this money is there, but we're not getting trained, we're not getting jobs. It brings clearly resentment. And I'm not saying there's going to be you know, physical attacks against Americans in Afghanistan. That clearly has been a mm -hmm. massive reason for the insurgency. So the predatory nature of aid and development, not always, of course, but mm -hmm. can be the contractors are benefiting at the expense of people. And that's not the rhetoric that often we hear about right. the NGO world. Absolutely. Now, just to push on that a little bit further, I remember after the Haitian earthquake that we interviewed some entrepreneurs. We had some conversations about mm -hmm. exactly this. Um, who's going to benefit from the aid money? They were confident that they would be able to bid, that they would be able to bring money uh, into fairly innovative projects inside Haiti benefiting local people. And maybe Why they did. They? Look, as I said, I don't know who you spoke to. And um, as I said, I don't want to say every single person who was in Haiti was a, was a gold digger. Far from it. There were some good people doing good work and NGOs doing good work. But, but it is hard for Haitian contractors to compete. Well, it's virtually impossible. And in fact, often there's, it's a no-bid contract pro process anyway. So the U.S. government and the USAID doesn't even have a bidding process. So that pretty much is problematic on its own. But I think the issue here is not so much that the U.S. government is not that interested in helping Haitians. The rhetoric obviously is we're aiming to help Haiti. I mean, that's, right. the, that's the idea. But Haiti is a U.S. client state. And Haiti has been seen for really 100 years, but more so in the last 30, as a way and a base for the US to get cheap clothing mm -hmm. for its citizens. So the problem is that the solution that successive governments, Bush administration, now Obama, and no doubt the next president after next year, their solution is to basically build industrial parks, which is another word for uh, right. slave labor. And that, I think, really goes to the heart of why we need to be really questioning of, particularly now that Hillary is a, is a candidate, her record in Haiti is pretty bad. And I think often that is glossed over, We're focusing on... Aid, aid, aid. Yes. So let's talk about Greece for a minute. I mean, there's a country where a lot of people came up with an alternative solution to the austerity-imposed cuts that were threatening health care, yep. um, basic food supplies, yeah. education, legal support, you name it. You... Okay, you were quite hopeful at the beginning of your chapter about Greece about, that yeah. Greeks were finding a way to practice kind of social solidarity rather than just calling outside contractors to deal with their crises. I was. Are you still hopeful? <laughs> Less so. I mean, I was in what Greece happened? last year and I was there before Syriza, which is the governing party now, won an election in January, won another election last month yeah, well, in September this year in 2015. I think Syriza was elected on the basis of rejecting European Union austerity, mm -hmm. to say there is another way for Greece to be independent. The truth is that I would argue, and many, I think, Greeks would argue this too, even those who voted for Syriza um, this year twice, it's been the great betrayal. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, there is a sense that the European Union now is so powerful and so undemocratic and so bureaucratic, and the IMF for that matter, that they essentially had a gun to their head, which was mm -hmm. arguably the case before Syriza won. And the solution that the European Union has imposed on Greece says privatisation is the only outcome. You must cut costs, you must cut benefits. The reality on the ground, and I spent time with people there, is healthcare has been slashed. Obviously in America, healthcare has been slashed forever, but in many European countries, there is a publicly funded healthcare system. That's collapsed. And of course, the result of that, apart from the rise of Syriza, is the rise of the far right and the rise of Golden Dawn, which is a neo-Nazi party. And I think in the West, often we have this idea that Nazism has been something in the past. The truth is, in Greece and many other European countries now, neo-Nazi parties are mainstream. Yeah. They are acceptable. They are seen as a, re a respectable way to solve problems. Now, most of them are not the leaders of the government. They're yeah. not. But the fear that I have, and many other people who write about Europe, is that with the migrant crisis yeah. overwhelming Europe, that the rise of the far right is inevitable. And in fact, in many European countries, you see, including in 
normally liberal Scandinavia, far-right yeah. parties are doing very well, and in Greece that's the case too. We see obviously in, in Hungary, which has one of the most far-right parties, elected Absolutely. into government control. Uh, and you beautifully put together this um, refugee crisis, migrant crisis, with mm. the economic crisis. You say that the need there in Greece was to create a new sense of identity, Absolutely. really. Um, and I wonder w how the sense of I the national identity is affected by all this contracting. I mean, isn't that also a threat to national identity? In Greece somehow? or just in general? In Greece, but also in Well, also indeed. In I mean, one of the things I talked about in Greece was that, as I said, the solution that was being imposed or really forced upon Greece by the European Union based in Brussels, the IMF and others, was that we don't really care about social problems. Yeah that it's almost like a de-humanitarian answer, that in other words, you, you, know, you guys might be suffering and there's medical problems and health problems, we don't care. Right. We are determined that we're going to impose financial restraints on your country. The problem is, of course, that the economy is not growing. I mean, virtually every economist in the world, right. from liberal to more conservative, have been saying for years, it's not working. Right. This is from Paul Krugman to you know, Thomas Piketty, a range of people but mostly on the left, but some on the right as well, have been saying this does not yeah. work. And despite that, there seems to be an insistence on doing so. So the challenge really now, I would argue, in Greece is when you have a far left party in government pledging to change the terms of austerity and they don't do it, what does that say about lefting, you know, the are now far, left, far left government in, in power, what does that say about their ability to resist that? And the result now in Greece and much of Europe and the UK is that the dream of a European Union, this sort of unified dream, is really crumbling. Yeah. Because I think if there were votes across Europe about the EU, do we stay in, do we go out, and the U UK is going to have that yeah. vote in a couple of years. Many on the left and the right don't believe that dream, and I would argue that they're yeah. right to be cynical about and that. And the now. more that you see your national treasures up for sale, the more your Absolutely. sense of national identity gets And Greece is about to privatise a lot more. Shattered. Okay, so I'm very discouraged already. Um, <laughs> there is hope in the book too, all right, by we, the way. I'll We're get going. there eventually. <laughs> um, is it predatory capitalism or just capitalism? Well, I mean, you talk about capitalism off the rails. Uh, aren't these the rails on which capitalism runs? Yes, yes. But I'd say it's more extreme, uh -huh. so. I mean, obviously, some people sort of say, well, you know, just take out the disaster, it's just capitalism by definition. I, yes, to an extent. But to me, there is a particular form of exploiting the most extreme forms but mm -hmm. to make it mainstream. So Haiti, obviously, you know, go back to that briefly, was an awful yeah. uh, natural disaster. But the way in which the US government and others deal with that is a choice. There's not, to me, yeah. it's not a question of the only way to manage Haiti is to privatise its industry and to mine its resources. There's another way to empower locals. It's not a radical solution. Which, in fact, the, the Greek solution, the Greek social solidarity efforts kind of showed. Um, moving to Afghanistan for just mm. a second, I have to say, I was reading your chapter on the Trans-Caspian um, uh, Pipeline. pipeline. As the news was breaking this fall around the, um, what we now know was a, a U.S. assault on the Médecins Sans Frontières hospital in yeah. Kunduz. Um, it's controversial what happened. We're still finding out. Mm -hmm. um, but I wondered what you were making of that situation. And first, whether you could tell us a little bit about how critical a medical, insti a medical institution like that is in the context of... Afghanistan today. I think in many ways I was obviously shocked but not that surprised. I mean, one looks at the US wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Saudi war currently in Yemen, medical facilities are not immune from attack. And the right. truth of the matter is that there's virtually never any accountability for doing so. Right. I'm not saying that it's obviously hard to tell at this stage that there was a deliberate plan to target a hospital. I mean, they may well have been, I don't know. Or the fact that we don't really care that we are targeting a hospital mm -hmm. and therefore what does it matter if we do. The critical reality of a neutral space in a war like Afghanistan, which is very far and few between, mm -hmm. MSF particularly, and I've spent time with them in Afghanistan, but also in South Sudan up in Basay this year, they are seen as neutral. Now, MSF is not perfect, no organization is, but they make a deliberate choice to base themselves in places where they're forced to negotiate with all sides. Yeah. So in theory, at least, doesn't always work this way, they're able to manage you know, the left side and the right side, and they can operate. I mean, they, I have some colleagues who I know have worked in the Kunduz um, facility in Afghanistan, and it was vital. The fact that that now has been destroyed, if nothing else plays into the narrative that I heard over and over again in Afghanistan, the U.S. deliberately targets humanitarian outfits. 
Now, the US would come back and say, we don't do that deliberately, it was an accident. Let's wait and see if yeah. that was the case. But yes, I think ultimately the reality will be that the space for humanitarian actors in Afghanistan will reduce. Meanwhile, the negotiations around this incredibly lucrative pipeline that was at the beginning of our relationship with Afghanistan, going back over a decade, is ongoing. Is ongoing and on track, of all things, to be opened and thriving in a couple of years. It is. And another thing also, which I was just in Afghanistan this year again, I'm working on a film also called Disaster Capitalism, which is a work in progress. And the focus in that is Afghanistan, Haiti and Papua New Guinea. But in Afghanistan, the focus is the untapped mineral resources mm -hmm. in that country. The US estimates roughly three to four trillion dollars of resources under the ground, mostly untapped because the country's been at war for 30 odd years. And now there is a really serious discussion from the US and private corporations in China, in the US, in Europe, to somehow exploit those resources, especially copper. And we spend time in an area called um, Mez Ainak, about one hour from Kabul, which has the largest copper deposit in the world, run by the Chinese. And the question really is, we spend time with locals who clearly are pretty upset about the fact that there's a mine maybe about to open down the road and they're getting nothing from that. Again, Afghanistan is at the crossroads. Is it going to make a decision from a government perspective, from the US government pressure mm. perspective, from the corporation perspective, to actually exploit its resources? And I would argue by doing so, you're almost guaranteed bringing more um, conflict. Yeah. The insurgency is fueled by that. So we have about a minute left. Your solutions. <laughs> How, how do we unravel some of this? You say at the end, and you quote Arundhati Roy really beautifully saying, it's not about tinkering with a system that needs to be replaced. It's true. And I guess one of the things I try to do in the book and also in the film is give at least a voice to people who are trying to resist what's going on in these countries. There's no simple single solution. I haven't got a simple single solution. But to me, in every country, there are simple things that can be done. To me, the idea of, say, after natural disaster, making a clear policy to actually empower and employ locals, it's not that difficult. Yes, sometimes it might require training, fine. Afghanistan, Haiti, Papua New Guinea, the US, wherever it may be. It's also, I think, a question to me of, I feel in the book, a challenge to the mainstream press, which I think routinely fail reporting on these countries accurately, to say, Actually, listen to what locals are saying. Yeah. Don't just, and I sometimes feel like as a journalist, often fairly, not um, hopeless, but a sense of challenge in my own industry to sort of say, we actually can do better than we're doing. Yeah. And it's not impossible to listen to locals in these countries. That's one goes a long way to changing the situation. Disaster Capitalism, Making a Killing Out of Catastrophe is just out from Verso Books. We'll put a link at our website. Check it out for yourself. Anthony Lowenstein, thanks for coming in. Thank you. You can hear more interviews like that on our audio podcast, available at thelfshow.org. M. Jackie Alexander is a writer, teacher, creator, and founder director of the Tobago Center for the Study and Practice of Indigenous Spirituality. She's a feminist who speaks and is heard far too rarely in the United States. Producer Anna Barson got to talk with her. Here's that report. Okay, so... Well, it, I think it's a really interesting moment to think about questions of location and subjectivity. Who are you? How you got to be who you are, where you are. Um, a lot of what foregrounds my scholarship and activism, I think, has to do with the things that formed me. I grew up in the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, at a time of a lot of great anti-colonial struggle. Mm. So it was a time of uh, a movement for independence, of course, which now we recognize didn't quite happen or wasn't quite complete. Um, but nonetheless, it was a very formative time. It was a very formative time in which we had a sense that um, another world was possible. So we were the first black children um, to benefit from nationalist education, which was a very important thing in the context of a kind of rewriting of the world, in perhaps the same way as the world is being rewritten right now. A rewriting, but a rewriting in India, Latin America, the Pacific, the Caribbean, 
in Africa, where folks were saying that the old terms of organizing society, those are going to be put out of the door in favor of something called self-governance. So the, the answer that I've given you is somewhat diffuse um, because we never quite know who we are <laughs> because we're always making and remaking ourselves. We, we know some of the inheritances that, 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 that we have and one of those inheritances for me is the anti-colonial inheritance. Another one is um, feminist and queer movements, women of color movements in particular here in the US. Um, and I think uh, a, a, another part of the inheritance is finding a way to meld all of those things together because they don't necessarily rest easily just by themselves. The source of our connection is a deeply spiritual one. It's, it's the divine connection. It's, it's that mirror reflection that Audrey talks about a lot too. The fact that you are reflected in me and I in you. And the, the source of that, I believe, is, is a source that is divine. It is, it is, that source is the source of spirit. That source is the source of what we can call the sacred. And we could call it anything. Um, and for folks who don't necessarily want to call it divine, that's fine too. <laughs> but at the very least, I think, if we recognize that interconnectedness, that, that, that sense in which we meet at a certain place, and that, that that meeting place is crucial for for who we are, how we think, what we do, and that there is a lot at stake in that meeting, right? There's a lot at stake in that meeting. Thanks to producer and editor Anna Barsan for that interview with Jackie Alexander. Laissez-faire capitalists love to argue that the market should be left alone. You don't need government or regulation to rein in bad companies with bad products. Consumers will do it on their own. The principle involved is called reputation, and it's amazing how vigorously then some governments will get involved to defend bad companies from shame. Several years ago, activists in North America, Europe, and Israel began campaigning for a boycott of companies based in occupied territory. Among those companies is the Ahava Corporation. In the U.S., women organized by Code Pink started showing up at Ahava stores dressed in bikinis daubed in mud. It's not pretty to be predatory, the women of the Stolen Beauty campaign said, while Ahava's packages said their skin creams come from the Dead Sea Israel, the mud actually comes from a site inside occupied territory, the activist pointed out, and it's manufactured into cosmetics in a factory in an illegal settlement deep within the Israeli-occupied West Bank. While Ahava's using Palestinian resources without permission or compensation, Palestinians themselves, of course, are denied access to the Dead Sea's shores, although one-third of the western shore of the sea lies in the occupied West Bank on Palestinian turf. For years, the European Union has been considering what to do about this. And as you can imagine, they've come under withering attack from the Israeli government. This fall, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu went all out and accused the Europeans of singling out Israel, invoking the Holocaust. He threatened to shun a series of high-level European meetings. And the rhetorical onslaught worked to the extent that instead of a boycott, the European Union is opting for labeling. This tepid option, products made in occupied territory, will henceforth bear labels that include the term Israeli settlement, while Palestinian products will be labeled product from the West Bank, Palestinian product, product from Gaza, or product from Palestine. The labeling will be mandatory for fruit and vegetables, wine, honey, olive oil, eggs, organic products, cosmetics, and voluntary for industrial stuff. It's tepid, but better than anything the U.S. government's done so far. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign continues. Truth in labeling, at least, is a start. Now, if only we could get the laissez-faire label removed from laissez-faire capitalism. It is anything but.
What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe, and thanks. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on the show, Naomi Murakawa indicts liberals for expanding the system of mass incarceration. Liberals adopted a particular ideology to explain and justify their transformation, and that ideology is racial liberalism. And we take a look back at our coverage of the Black Lives Matter movement. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Andrew Coburn discusses what's wrong with the way the U.S. fights war. George Bush, let's hear it for George Bush. Um, he was actually quite restrained in his use of deployment of drone assassination because he preferred to capture people and torture them. Later in the program, we look at the story of Fahd Ghazi. Fahd Ghazi was one of the first men to arrive at Guantanamo. He was just a few months past his high school graduation. <laughs> 